Hello and welcome to the Unit 8 podcast. In this unit, we're going to be exploring some of the darker side of the 19th century, which saw European countries engaged in intense competition with one another over dominance. Industrial powers such as Britain, France, and the newly formed countries such as Germany jousted for supremacy, not only at home, but also overseas. This was the era of European imperialism, in which the countries of Europe carved up Africa and Asia in a race to dominate them. Imperialism was not only born out of competition, but also out of racism and social ideologies that Europeans used to justify their oppression over the rest of the world. In this unit, we're going to see the age of optimism be replaced by a general anxiety across Europe as the competition and runaway militarism starts to lead towards war. What you see here is a painting from 1893 by Edvard Munch, The Scream, which in many ways reflects the fear and the horror that many people experienced at the end of the 19th century as we move closer and closer to World War I. All right, let's get started. The learning objectives for this unit are, number one, Explain the causes and impact of imperialism on the West and on the world. Number two, understand the characteristics of the European political and cultural environment at the turn of the 20th century. And number three, describe some of the major developments in the era, including the erosion of liberalism, the fight for women's suffrage, and the decline of the Ottoman Empire. So here we see a map of Europe at the end of the 19th century. If you recall from the last unit, we talked about how the second half of the 19th century, the so-called Age of Optimism, had witnessed the Second Industrial Revolution, which had witnessed a massive um, expansion of the economy and the industrial base across Europe. This had been felt in many places, but none as much as Britain and also in Germany. Germany, of course, was a new country. But its creation had basically upset the balance of power in Europe. So the last two decades of the 19th century, there was this general anxiety building about how that balance of power would ultimately play out. So after the formation of Germany in the late 19th century, the stage is really set now for World War I. However, there is one other ingredient, which is what turns World War I from being a local conflict into being a global one, and that's imperialism. By 1800, there was a new drive from Europeans to colonize Africa and Asia. Now, this is um, different from the focus that Europeans had had before, which is setting up colonies in the Americas. Um, but it's a very different process doing it in the Americas versus doing it in the old world, doing it in Africa and Asia. And the biggest thing is just um, the people that are already there. So um, uh, the new world populations of the Americas had already been decimated by European diseases. And this allowed Europeans to more easily just uh, push them out of the way and impose their own colonies. However, after 1800, it really became um, a part of European competition between countries to try to set up empires abroad. The idea was that you would set up these empires and then you would suck them dry of all their resources. You would completely dominate and impose your rule over the local people. And so when you see Africa here, uh, you see it carved up between many different countries. So this was a form of competition between European powers. So when you look at that map, you see a lot of green that's under the control of France. You see a lot of of um, uh, orange, which is the control of Britain, uh, some of Belgium, some of Portugal, and you also even see uh, some colonies that Germany set up, such as Cameroon and German East Africa and German Southwest Africa. Uh, Germany, because it was uh, late in being, f in being formed, was a little bit late to the game of uh, creating um, an overseas empire, but they quickly scrambled uh, to catch up. So let's dig a little bit deeper into why 19th century imperialism even exists. So first of all, there are economic motives. Um, Europeans are able to develop markets. That is that they create sort of almost like a mercantile environment where the um, colonized country has to buy your products. Um, and also it's, it's the ability to suck those areas dry of resources as well. So once you impose your rule, you can take whatever you want out of it. 
the um, reality was is that these colonies were rarely profitable. They were quite expensive to run. I mean, think about um, uh, all of the infrastructure that uh, European countries had to set up before they can start to suck it dry of resources. But still, it's it's uh, there's this drive to do it nevertheless. There's also a certain amount of social motives. So Europeans um, at the time had expanding populations, and at least there was arguments publicly at the time that creating overseas empires would provide um, space for European poor people to move. Um, the reality is, is that most of these places already had plenty of people living in them, and very few Europeans actually moved into these regions, South Africa being, I suppose, one of the exceptions to that. Um, Above and beyond, probably the biggest reason why imperialism takes place is nationalistic motives. So this is competition between the different countries. So whether it makes sense, whether it's economically viable, doesn't matter. Everyone wants their own empire. Everyone wants to get in on the action. And the final reason are ideological motives. And that has to do with um, some of the things that were going on in the 19th century. Um, one of the biggest ones was um, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. So um, uh, Charles Darwin uh, was a naturalist who came up with the idea that uh, plants and animals um, have evolved, including us, have evolved over time by natural selection um, uh, to be what we are today. Other people, took his theories and warped them in ways that Darwin never intended. Um, and they took it to, uh, to the extent that countries also evolve. And therefore, a country um, who's more powerful, just like in nature, a more powerful species has every right to dominate a less powerful species or even make them go extinct. Under the idea of social Darwinism, a country that is more powerful can has every right to conquer poorer and weaker countries. Uh, this was called social Darwinism. Um, it is not at all scientific. It is, and it is, um, you know, quite obviously evil. Um, but it was widely believed amongst European intellectuals that um, th that that this justified what Europe was doing. That it justified their expansion and subjugation of of people in other parts of the world. There was also a form of paternalism. The idea that these um, countries can't fend for themselves. They aren't as sophisticated as us, and therefore we have to take care of them by imposing our rule and making them part of our empire. Um, so paternalism and social Darwinism play a role. Um, and you can see evidence of these type of attitudes in all sorts of cultural elements from the 19th century from Europe. One really big example is a poem um, uh, by Rudyard Kipling called The White Man's Burden. Rudyard Kipling was an American, and The White Man's Burden be, has grown to become symbolic of this attitude that it is uh, white people's right to go and enslave the rest of the world uh, because uh, because it is. And um, uh, that was widely held belief during the 19th century. So this is the poem by Rudyard Kipling, The White Man's Burden. Um, take up the white man's burden, send forth the uh, best ye breed. Go send your sons to exile to serve your captives' need, to wait in heavy harness, unfluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Uh, so this uh, obviously was an incredibly um, uh, demeaning way of looking at the rest of the world. Uh, and it, it reinforced this idea that it was uh, white people had a responsibility to therefore somehow look after the rest of the world because white people were more superior. And that was that was the belief that was very widely held amongst the intellectual caste in the 19th century. Another example is just this advertisement for um, soap. Um, you can look at it. It's an incredibly offensive racist ad. It says the first step towards lightening the white man's burden is through teaching the virtues of cleanliness. Pears soap is a potent factor in brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances. While those uh, amongst the cultured of all nations, it holds the highest place. It is the ideal toilet soap. Uh, so there is lots and lots of this type of racist literature from the 19th century. Again, it all is about justifying and reinforcing the, um, the belief that Europe has every right to be doing the nasty, horrible things that they were doing.
Here's another contemporary explanation of a justification for uh, the racism of the imperialistic age. This is from um, the uh, Judge magazine in April of 1899. And here you see um, the, the British um, uh, represented by John Bull there uh, in front and then the American Uncle Sam uh, behind carrying uh, the rest of the world's population on their backs and you can see that they're stepping over things like uh, barbarism and ignorance and superstition and ironically oppression um, and it, this again um, is reinforcing what many in the intellectual class believed in the 19th century and that is that white European countries were justified in um, exerting their dominance over the rest of the world um, and is awful and as uncomfortable it is for us to look at these images it's important in order for us to understand the mindset of the European intellectual class um, which drove imperialism um, throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. So let's talk a little bit about some of the consequences of imperialism and obviously this is you know just a tiny little bit i'm going to be discussing it really um you could do a whole course on the consequences of imperialism and we're in fact really still feeling those consequences today and when you look about how power is shared around the world today in many respects it's still a legacy of the imperialistic age so first of all, within the colonized countries, um, there was economic and resource exploitation. So Europeans came and took a lot of the available resources right off the bat from the peoples who lived there. There was also um, quite a bit of infrastructure changes. So throughout Europe, uh, throughout Africa, rather, um, we see the um, construction of railways and city planning. Um, and all of this um, obviously transforms the visible landscape of the colonized countries. When the Europeans uh, left, they created states which essentially ignored the existing ethnic and cultural boundaries. And after World War I, when um, Europeans began to sort of disentangle themselves to a certain extent from their African and Asian possessions, um, the boundaries that they created essentially set up an environment where war was going to be inevitable within these areas because Europeans paid no attention whatsoever to the existing divisions that existed there, whether they be on ethnic or linguistic or cultural lines. Um, and that again, we are still living with those legacies today. So boundaries of, you know, which had more to do with where Germany had landed and where Britain had landed in Africa um, still exist in some cases with the division of African countries today. Um, the uh, introduction of Western ideas and Western education didn't universally benefit the colonized peoples whatsoever at all. In most cases, it was really only offered to the elites of the indigenous society that was being colonized. And so what this did is it further exasperated divisions within those countries between um, an elite class that had access to Western education and the vast majority of the people who did not have access to that same information. Um, and also, of course, um, there was the grand exportation of many European ideas, including nationalism. And nationalism, as we've already talked about before in this course, is an infectious idea. And once it spreads, it's really difficult to take away. Nationalism will continue to drive movements of people to want to form their own countries, to want to have a say in their own affairs, and to define what the nation means to them on their own terms. And all of this is uh, just a bit of the legacy of imperialism on the rest of the world. So not all um, uh, of the world took it lying down is another part of history that you should know as well too. Whenever possible, many of, many of these colonies fought back against the Europeans. Um, different parts of the world reacted differently to the European threat. One example is uh, the Boxer Rebellion in China, which lasted for two years between 1898 and 1900. Uh, it ultimately failed, but it was a major act of defiance against um, European powers. Another example is India's Great Mutiny in 1857. Seven, uh, which again was a failed attempt to push out the British out of Italy. And another example, which will have profound 
profound importance to history, and I'm actually going to come back to it in the next podcast, and that is the Meiji Restoration in Japan from 1868 onward. Japan um, not only uh, reacted um, in an aggressive manner um, against Europeans um, with imperialism, but also Japan sought very quickly to emulate them and to industrialize. And, and we'll see how Japan um, really uniquely transforms itself into a powerful industrialized country within just a few decades, uh, all as a result of a reaction against this European imperialism. And we're going to turn back to that because it will play a role in World War II when Japan uh, becomes one of the world powers. So one of the other things that we see in Europe at the very end of the 19th and early 20th centuries is a weakening of the liberal consensus. And what I mean by the liberal consensus is the ideas that came out of the Enlightenment that were at the heart of the Industrial Revolution as well, which um, essentially um, uh, was for individual rights, uh, the idea that all men were equal and uh, that people should be free to be able to engage in uh, business. Um, so, you know, the, the birth of factories and factory owners, that's all uh, part and parcel of liberalism and emphasis on individual rights. Um, yet, once we get to the late 19th century, we start to see um, a lot of changes. First of all, liberal politicians themselves seem to become more pragmatic as their power becomes more entrenched. Now, what I mean by that is that they're, um, they tended to in abandon and in some of the principles that we would normally associate with liberalism, such as a free market economy. And, in, and instead, they might advocate for things like tariffs um, and uh, relying on the colonies um, as sort of captive markets. So normally liberalism would be about the, um, the not having any tariffs, similar to Adam Smith and his laissez-faire economic view. Liberalism as well um, started to find itself essentially incapable of solving many of the problems that uh, Europe faced in the late 19th century. Um, so, you know, for example, um, the, the, the great wealth inequality of the late 19th century um, would require to some degree that liberalism uh, give rights to workers, um, but that would of course come at the expense of factory owners and liberalism really uh, couldn't do that. And also there was a lot of contradictions within liberalism, for example, that although they uh, saw no problem with giving the vote to all men, they also uh, didn't mind that they were um, uh, disenfranchising women who weren't given the vote or or people of color, for example. And so liberalism then towards the end of the 19th century really has lost some of its cachet. And what that does is it creates a political vacuum where we start to see other political ideologies and movements begin to um, uh, become more popular. For instance, on the left side of the political spectrum, we begin to see much more uh, socialist movements, and this is born out of the idea of workers' rights. And um, we will see uh, once we move into the 20th centuries that some of those uh, social movements will even result in revolution, such as the Russian Revolution. We also start to see alternatives on the right side of the political spectrum. When we last spoke about conservatism, we were talking about uh, coming out of the Napoleonic Wars and conservatism then was concerned with preserving uh, the birthright privileges of the aristocratic class. Conservatism at the end of the 19th century has changed quite a bit. Now conservatism um, often is tied much more to popularism, the idea that, uh, and nationalism, the idea that um, countries should sort of um, fend for themselves and and that, um, uh, you know, populist nationalist leaders um, uh, can um, lead the nation into a better place than simply liberalism could. Also, we start to see uh, racism and anti-Semitism in particular become really important driving forces for this uh, new resurgent right conservative um, political uh, movement. And so all of this really is coming to the forefront at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, right on the eve of World War I. So I want to talk a little bit more about suffrage. Suffrage um, is a word that means the right to vote. And originally, liberalism had been a major proponent of universal suffrage, that is, allowing all men the right to vote. Um, originally, suffrage was much more restricted. Um, the right to vote, when it finally came, was restricted by class or more frequently is restricted by property ownership or by wealth. 
So it wasn't something that just anybody could do. However, over time, European countries began to ease those restrictions. By 1871, only Switzerland had universal male suffrage, but by 1900, just about every European country allowed most men to vote. So male universal suffrage had been achieved. Female suffrage, though, was something that was going to have to wait a lot longer. Uh, liberalism really uh, you know, did not um, do anything to try to help women achieve the vote, and most liberal politicians had no problem whatsoever with disenfranchising women uh, in their quest to have the vote. But towards the end of the 19th century, more and more women are pushing for um, women's suffrage, and in some cases their movements are becoming um, uh, very, very active politically, and this was definitely the case in Britain. So here you see an image of a female suffrage suffrage who had chained herself to the gates of Buckingham Palace in 1914. So right before World War I, um, uh, the rights of women voting uh, pretty much were nowhere. So women really did not have that right. But over the course of World War I, as we'll see uh, as we proceed further in the course, um, women will finally slowly uh, begin to achieve that right, but it will take some time. Um, women's suffrages, however, in the 19th and early 20th centuries were demonized by um, male politicians. Male politicians presented them as um, the antithesis of, of the family. They presented them as um, anarchists and and that they would um, lead to giving women the vote would lead to the breakdown of civil society, the breakdown of the family structure. Of course, all of this was nonsense, but this was the environment in which women had to fight in order to eventually achieve the vote. So as we move at the end of the 19th century from the age of optimism into something else, one could generalize that European society is moving from a state of optimism into a state of anxiety. And we can see this in many ways, first of all, in the breakdown of the uh, liberal consensus uh, that I just spoke about, but we can also see it in other areas as well, too. One example is how philosophy changed from Enlightenment ideas, which um, uh, put reason and rationality at the forefront, to new movements uh, such as those epitomized by Nietzsche and Bergson. So uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, for example, um, argued that reason couldn't solve human problems. He famously declared that God was dead. And if we can put God and religion on the outside, well then now we are free to upturn convention and overthrow all of our constraints. Similarly, Henri Bergson um, argued that science couldn't really teach us truth, that truth could only be found by looking inward, looking through human emotion. So um, this new stress on the power of the irrational is a major movement uh, away from where we were a hundred years earlier. We also start to see changes in other areas too. A good example is Sigmund Freud, who single-handedly created a whole new uh, sphere of psychology that is uh, psychoanalysis. According to Freud, we are all ruled by our unconscious. We're all ruled by uh, an, an irrational part of ourselves and that any psychic problems that we might have, we would need to treat the unconscious part of ourselves in order to deal with them. Uh, and so the idea that all of our human decisions are ruled by an irrational part of ourselves, an unconscious part of ourselves, really just added you know, fuel to the fire of this new view of, of human beings being um, largely irrational, living in an irrational world. This is also reflected in art of the period. Um, so we start to see a movement away from realism, which dominated uh, the age of optimism, into something that uh, is referred to as avant-garde. And that just means uh, forefront in French. And this was a type of art which was intentionally challenging for audiences to understand. It um, emphasized breaking of taboos and conventions, all in favor of artistic creativity, one that emphasized emotion. And here you see uh, one of the quintessential examples of this type of art by Edvard Munch, uh, which uh, emphasized scenes of violence, fear, and horror. Um, and this is, again, a turn towards the inner experience and inner emotions, um, which is an expression of this 
overall societal shift away from optimism to one of anxiety. The science of the late 19th and early 20th centuries becomes infinitely more complex. And one could argue that this also really is contributing to this sense of anxiety. Whereas it seemed um, just a few decades earlier that science was on the verge of figuring everything out, the work of people like Max Planck and Albert Einstein showed that we really knew nothing at all, or that we were really only at the beginning of our understanding. Max Planck had really essentially created a whole new discipline of quantum physics. Um, he uh, understood that light was more than just a wave, that it consisted of individual particles of, of what he called quanta, individual packs of energy. Albert Einstein, on the other hand, essentially had us question the entire nature of space and time, adding the fourth dimension mention of time, that time is a relative thing, that it, it, it exists relative to the observer. These are complex scientific ideas. They are not things that are intuitively gra uh, get graspable by regular people. They require deep understanding of mathematics, um, and it, it contributes as well to a breakaway from the overall positivism and sense of human progress that the decades prior in the age of optimism had uh, brought forth. By the end of the 19th century, the political stability of Europe was also on the verge of breaking apart. And one of the reasons for that is the increasing fragility of those large empires. And we've already talked a bit before about how large empires were breaking at the seams because of concepts like nationalism, which had really threatened their existence. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire being good examples. The Ottoman Empire in particular by the end of the 19th century was in trouble. It sometimes was referred to as the uh, quote unquote sick man of Europe. And really what that meant was that the vast territory that it controlled, um, there was a belief that sooner or later other European powers were going to be able to gobble it up. And this also threatened the balance of power because if the Ottoman Empire fell apart, who was going to hold sway over that vast territory? So here you see a map of the Ottoman Empire at its greatest extent and then where it was in 1914, which is really just centered mostly around Anatolia and the little strip down along the Red Sea. All the other areas had slowly but surely been chipped away from the Ottoman Empire. So by the beginning of the 20th century, most observers would probably say that there is war likely on the horizon. Um, tension had been growing in Europe uh, during the last couple of decades of the 19th century, um, and largely this has to do with Germany and its very existence. So I talked about um, how the creation of Germany had all at once created um, a power imbalance within Europe because the component parts that went into Germany, particularly Prussia, had been already heavily industrialized and its creation essentially created a rival against Britain, the other most powerful country in Europe. And so everyone knew that before long it was going to come to a head. And certainly by the 20th century, we see evidence of an arms race between Britain and Germany. At the same time, we see um, that uh, those big empires such as Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire are teetering on the edge. They're dealing with problems of nationalistic movements within their borders and the fragility of these empires threatens to destable all of Europe. Also, autocracies such as Russia are also teetering on the edge by the end of the 19th century. Russia is a vast country that has in some ways modernized and in other ways it had painfully not. Um, in, it was still structured um, in terms of the way power was distributed, essentially in a feudalistic medieval system. And it was ripe for change, as we will see actually in the uh, next module. So all of this is hinting at a coming war, but it's not the only uh, reasons why war might be on the horizon. The democracies within Europe themselves were also vulnerable. There was the challenge of equality within those democracies. So obviously women had been disenfranchised and there were large movements to try to achieve the vote for women, but they were there were also equally large movements pushing back against women's suffrage. We see the weakening of the liberal consensus that had essentially bound Europe together during the age of optimism, but was now falling apart at the seams.
we see uh, movements uh, from the left and movements from the right, labor movements. Um, we see economic disparity continuing to create intense poverty amongst many of the European population. We also see right on the eve of the war, the introduction of alliance systems ostensibly to prevent war, um, which of course, as we will see in the uh, next unit, really are the final straw, which leads to war. So that's it for this last few steps before we get to World War One. In the next unit, we were, are going to see how it all comes to a head and how Europe um, enters into the worst war that human beings have ever seen. And this time, it's not going to be a local war because Europe has extended its tentacles all around the planet into every nook and cranny. Well, this one is going to be a global war. The entire planet will be marshaled into this conflict and it will result in millions and millions of dead people. That will all be talked about next week in The Great War.